talk which is linked on the schedule. Sebastian, do, do you want to say that? Well, just to say that you can populate the Google Doc with any questions, so not just specifically to uh, the speaker. So please put there any question you want that will be discussed in, uh, in half an hour or so. Sounds good. All right, the next speaker is Stephanie. Uh, we'll talk about resolving the physics of the CGM through Quasar Lyman Alpha Nebula. So take it away. You want Oh, I've got it. <laughs> Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um. Um, yeah, sorry for that. So, again, I'm Stephanie Devere. I'm a PhD student with Sebastiano at Milano Bicocca. And today I'll be talking to you about the Refine project, whose aim it is to resolve the, kinematic, the physics of the CGM through Quasar Lyman Alpha Nebula. So this morning you already heard about the amazing opportunity offered to us by Lyman Alpha Nebula around bright quasars to resolve the physics of the CGM in emission. Um, because we're looking at some of the brightest quasars known at Redshift 3, and we're looking at the nebula around them, the emission is dominated by recombination radiation. This means the brightness is given by the density squared times the recombination coefficient alpha. So ideally, we would be able to derive the density of the gas contributing to the emission. The whole thing gets a bit more complicated because actually the brightness in each of these cells of these observations of Lyman alpha nebula are given by the integral along the line of sight of the density squared times the recombination coefficient. So this introduces the degeneracy between the broadness of the density distribution in the cell and the average density in that cell. This is quantified by the clumping factor defined here. What further complicates the matter is that in addition to this, the brightness of, this, the brightness of these nebula is also expected to scale with the halo mass and other physical properties of the, of the lime alpha emitting gas. So if we want to study the physical properties, we first need to fix the mass of the halo hosting these quasars and the associated Lyman alpha nebula. The good news is, as you already heard this morning, we have access to the kin kinematics of this emitting gas through our spectroscopic observations with mu's, etc. So for us, the question became, can we actually constrain the mass of the halos hosting these objects through the kinematics of the CGM revealed through Lyman alpha emission? To answer this question, I looked at the Eagle and Engine cosmological simulation. I looked at halos at registers 3 and 3.5 with masses above 10 to the 11.75 solar masses. I assumed that there was a very bright ionizing quasar in the center of all these halos, which immediately ionizes all the gas, and then it emits recombination radiation um, based on its temperature. So we are operating under the assumption of maximum fluorescence. I calculate the emissivity of all non-star forming gas in a three co-moving megaparsec box around each halo. You can see that here. And then generate MUSE compatible mock observations along three perpendicular lines of sight for each halo, which you can see here. We then extract all the nebula with Q the standard CubeX pipeline, and then to get to the kinemat observable kinematical obs information, sorry, we uh, look at the second flux-weighted second moment maps i.e. the velocity dispersion maps, which you can see here. It's worth noting that we don't model any rate to transfer effects, so we're also not accounting for the typical resonant broadening of the Lyman alpha line. But as I'll explain to you in a few slides, our results are actually independent of this, so that was great news. Uh, the first thing we looked at were the radial velocity profiles of the Lyman alpha emitting gas, which you can see here in blue, the hot gas in orange, and the dark matter in gray. The four panels just refer to uh, the different halo masses we looked at, looked at. The radial velocity profiles of the Lyman alpha emitting gas clearly track that of the dark matter. So this means that the kinematics of this gas is dominated by gravity. What you can also see is that the maximum infill velocity of the gas increases with halo mass, and the deceleration point is always roughly at 1.25 virial radii. 
So if we could measure these two quantities, we could actually fairly easily derive the halo mass. However, radial velocity is very sadly not an observable, so I switched to the velocity dispersion profiles. You can see them here for redshift 3 and 3.5, and the different colored lines just refer to different halo masses. Clearly, the values of the velocity dispersion increase with halo mass, and also the shapes of the profiles become flatter and less concave with increasing halo mass. Um, we wanted to exactly quantify how this change of shape depends on halo mass. So I rescaled the values by the central maximum velocity dispersion value and also rescaled the x-axis by the real radius of each halo. And you can see they all become self-similar. So the shape is clearly dominated by the mass of the halo hosting the quasar and the associated Lyman alpha nebula. What's also... Um, a really great result for us is that based on uh, co-spatial Lyman alpha nebula and helium nebula, which we have observations of, we found that the shape of the velocity dispersion profiles is also independent of resonant broadening effects. So we can actually use the shape to constrain the mass of the halo hosting these things. Also, the self-similarity is redshift independent. Um, I'm not sure how well it shows up, but this black dashed line is actually a polynomial fitted to all individual rescaled velocity dispersion profiles, and you can see it fits equally well at all redshift. So the shape really is given by the mass of the halo. To take advantage of this, we defined a more observer-friendly uh, variable called eta, which is the ratio of the median velocity dispersion in an outer annuli divided by the median so it's a ratio, it's the median in the outer annuli divided by the median velocity dispersion values in the inner annuli. We've, I've plotted this eta of the individual simulated Lyman alpha nebula as a function of halo mass. And despite a scatter, you can see that this eta is very clearly correlated with the halo mass. It increases with halo mass by design. The purple shaded region is just the average plus minus the standard deviation. What I can also do using the polynomial I showed you on the last slide is define an analytical expression for this eta as a function of halo mass, and it fits very well with, our, with the individual eta's of the individual nebula. The two great advantages of using this eta to derive a halo mass is that it can very easily be measured from observations, and also by construction it's independent of these pesky resonant broadening effects. So the procedure I would suggest is that one measures this eta of a sample of observed Lyman alpha nebula and then uses this analytical expression to associate a, a characteristic halo mass with a sample of the Lyman alpha nebula. This is exactly what I did for three MUSE observed Lyman alpha nebula samples, the MARG and the MQM samples at redshift 4, 3.5, and 3. I used the distribution of the eta's, which you can see here with the shaded region, and use the analytical ex expression from the last slides to derive a characteristic halo mass. The log of the halo masses I get are 12.22, 12.16, and 12.11. If we combine all three samples, we get a characteristic halo mass of 10 to the 12.16 solar masses. There's two things I want you to take away from this. Firstly, all the halo mass estimates seem to be very close to 10 to the 12 solar masses. Secondly, there seems to be very little redshift evolution from redshift 4 to redshift 3. Um, a very fair question would be how does this compare to quasar autocorrelation results and quasar galaxy cross-correlation results? You can see that here. Our results are the yellow stars. So compared to some higher redshift autocorrelation results, we have slightly lower estimates. But compared to the Eftekarta data results and also to the whole band of quasar galaxy cross correlation results, we're actually in very good agreement. So mass is close to 10 to the 12 and very little redshift evolution for this redshift range. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that this is the mass of these objects, what can we say about the density of the gas in the CGM, which was the reason why we wanted to fix the halo mass? To try and answer this question, I generated surface brightness profiles of all the mock observations while varying the maximum density above which the gas is considered to be star-forming and thus not contribute to the emissivity of the Lyman alpha nebula. Then compare those simulated mock surface brightness profiles to the real observed ones. You can see this here for redshift 3.5 and redshift 3. 
And obviously, the observations indicate that we need the gas to reach maximum densities of 1 to 10 atoms per cc throughout the whole CGM to explain the observed surface brightness profiles. And this is actually really interesting because these types of simulations normally only predict such high densities in the interstellar medium of galaxies, not throughout the whole CGM. Um, also, in addition to this, a uh, quite broad density distribution, a higher clumping factor and maybe higher coal gas fraction, are also needed to explain these observed values, especially at redshift 3. We can also look at the redshift evolution of the surface brightness values. So from theory, we'd expect them to increase with redshift and scale with 1 plus z to the power of 5. That's exactly what the simulations do. So you can see here surface brightness ratios with respect to redshift 4. They increase as we'd, as we'd expect. The observations don't behave like that. The uh, values are unexpectedly high at redshift 3 with regard to redshift 4. So what this tells us is that the broadness of the density distribution must be increasing with time, which is very likely driven by an increase of turbulence with time, which we have experts about this in, this in the room. This could very well be to, for instance, instabilities along the accreting filaments driving the formation of cold, dense gas in the CGM. We checked whether increasing the resolution would help. It doesn't uh, increase in the, in the resolution of the cosmological simulations actually dims the surface brightness profiles. So we're really missing a mechanism that will help us form cold dense, dense gas throughout the CGM. Um, I'll leave you, leave you here with my summaries to um, give time for question, but the two main points are kinematics of, of the CGM can help us estimate halo masses, and we need cold dense gas throughout the CGM to explain the observed values. Thanks a lot. All right. Plenty of time for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I, I missed the argument for why it was better to take the ratio of two different uh, velocity dispersions as opposed to a velocity dispersion at a fixed radius. Could you go through that again? Of course, yeah. So what we found is that actually the shape of the velocity dispersion profile is most dominated by halo mass. Um, the reason why we don't want to trust the individual velocity dispersion values from observations is they are affected by resonant broadening effects, which we can't model yet. We don't have the resolution to do so. But the shape should be unaffected. So if we take the ratio, we're basically measuring the shape. Thanks. Um, you, so you compared um, a couple of different simulations, it mm -hmm. seems like, and you spoke about resolution effects. Do you have any comment on um, like uh, difference in feedback model that could manifest different yeah. results? We looked into that. I just didn't have time. So we compared uh, the Eagle high-resolution simulations, AGM feedback, no AGM feedback. It actually doesn't affect the cold gas. So um, that was quite a cool, interesting finding. But remember, we're at redshift 3, 3.54, so you wouldn't expect the agent feedback to be too strong yet anyway. Yeah, yeah for your uh, redshift 3 to 4 result in the, uh, the sort of the high densities or turbulence, yeah. if you were to take Eagle and like put the densities high enough to match that data, would you, how would you do with the cosmic baryon fraction in the halos? Would you start to go above that? Um, I actually haven't looked into that at all, but thanks, I'll look into that in the future. What, what I will say, though, is... Sebastian is saying yes. Yeah, yeah. You will overshoot the barium fraction. So you definitely need something, something else. All right. Uh, yeah. Can the next speaker come up and set up? I was wondering whether the patchiness patterns of the H-alpha that you do uh, detect can be, or Lyman alpha, can be used as a way to constrain the, called the power spectrum of the distribution and therefore constrain what the clumpiness factor might be. I would guess that your simulations would predict rather smooth distributions, mm -hmm. whereas the reality is that you have very lumpy things that you've actually observed. Is that information possibly useful? Um. Potentially, what I will say, though, is that the surface brightness maps of the Lyman Alpha Nebula are actually very smooth. 
So we're interpreting that to mean that the emission predominantly comes from very quite small dense clouds, so on sub-KPC levels, which is why we can't resolve them in observations yet. All right, if you have more questions, please put it on the Google Doc. And let's thank the speaker again.